Hello everyone, Carlos here. So this video is an overview of a blog post about the challenges of healthcare that they're facing right now when it comes to ransomware. Now, this is based on our experience working ransomware cases in the sector. I have to be honest, we have been in some cases that are heartbreaking. I've worked with uh, Justin from our team, with Tyler Hudak and others, where we have seen doctors and nurses struggling uh, just to get access to the information they need to treat their patients. In fact, I still remember coming back from lunch one day and seeing an ambulance being turned away. So this is a very, very serious issue that we're seeing out there happening. Now, let's start with why healthcare. Now, healthcare is targeted because of the risk of a delayed resolution to the problem at hand, which is everything being encrypted and services being down. And the main reason for this is that lives are affected or they can be lost. And in many cases, just making that payment as quickly as possible allows them to recover a lot faster to be able to do all of that. So it's not primarily financial, but also it is kind of like a human factor so that is why they're also targeted. In addition to that, one of the things that we're seeing is that when we look at in the dark market, the dark web out there, and people are selling records, healthcare records go for higher prices. Sometimes it could be one third more, or it could be even double. Uh, and that's one of also the main reasons for the attacker. From a financial point of view, they can get faster payments. In addition to that, they can get more money for the data that are extracting from those systems. Now. The next step is what we can we do about it? And that, and we start with mapping assets and business processes. Now, you cannot protect what you don't know needs protecting. You need to identify all, all of those assets. That includes an inventory of all of the hosts, the applications, uh, who are the users of those applications, because we cannot restore a server and a database, but if we don't restore the laptops and desktops of the users that use those, we haven't kind of like advanced a lot. We've just gotten to a certain point, but we're still not operational to that entire operational gamut of everything that makes up that inventory of that specific host application and who are those that use those. And then what we do is that we look at the data. How critical is that data that it is in those systems? Well, how critical is that information as it fits into the business? How does it relate to the different operations that we perform? Once we have all of this from an initial go, we need to establish a way to maintain this. That means that we have to be on a regular basis looking at all of our assets and updating our inventory because business evolves, systems change, they get patches, they get update, new software gets introduced, users sometimes install new stuff and bring new devices depending on your BYOD policies. So stuff changes in that environment. So it's important that we have a process to maintain and update and also prune all stuff out of that inventory that we have. Now, once we have all of that inventory of all of the machines, all of the users and everything that's being used there, we then map that to our business processes and how critical are they? So now we have kind of like a layered approach of what goes where and what value does it represent to us. Also very important that we look for partners. We have actually been in cases where we see that one entity has been affected, they have a partnership with another, that means that they have access to their systems, either via applications or even interconnections via the networks. And we have seen that attacker move from one side to the other, either exfiltrating data or even doing, taking destructive action. So it's important that we identify all of our different partners so we can inform them in time. Or if a partner gets affected, we know that we what actions we need to take to isolate ourselves from the damage happening over there. Uh, also, this opens the mind of several of our customers when it comes like, hey, do we have redundancy when it comes to this type of partnership of the services that they provide, depending on the criticality of the uh, services that we provide and form part of our business processes, we may need to look and have other ones available to us. The next step is going to be backup and recovery. Once we know our important assets and how they fit into our business. Now we are able to set priorities and how, what we should be protecting and what level of protection should we have. Uh, not all backup solutions are made equal and we can most, uh, uh, and I 
have to be honest, I have not seen one single environment with one single type of solution. They have a mixture. Some of them are going to be a lot faster than others, uh, depending on the needs of the business and how quickly they need to restore that data. But it is still very important that you have some of that data offline in a different building, in a different data center, uh, just to have that air gap there so the attacker cannot move and destroy backups. Because a lot of attackers are going to find out what is your backup solutions, target those, in addition to targeting the backups themselves. Because that means that they're going to be putting a lot more pressure on you to pay up. In addition to that, it is very important that we learn our backup solutions very well. Many times uh, in the middle of a fire is not the best time to go like, hey, how do we search our backups to see if a file exists here or a DLL has been backed up by Axiom? Because that DLL, that file, that executable can be the actual entry point of the attacker into your network. It could be the remote access tool. It could be the implant that they have placed inside of there. And you're just giving them again, access to your environment. Also, this can be a tool that we can use to find that patient zero. So we know what is that initial entry point and which systems do, should we prioritize when it comes to forensic data acquisition to process. In addition to that, it's important that you have proper SLAs with your partners or your providers. Why? Because you don't wanna grab the, the phone and call them and say, I need you to come over here as quickly as possible to help us put our tape unit back into functioning state or install the software or help us set all of this stuff because you're the ones who set it up. Uh, and they go like, you know what? Your contract says that uh, it is best effort or you have an SLA of 24 hours or 40 hours. And if they're overwhelmed, uh, they can go like, hey, yeah, we'll be there in 24 hours or we'll be there in two days. And that may not fit in time of your planning and your rehearsal and everything that you have done to be able to get those systems as quickly as possible, given the business needs. Now, the next step is going to be insert response planning. So right now we have identified all of our assets. How critical are they? How do they fit? What should we be backing up? How should we be backing it up? And now we're moving into something happened. How do we perform insert response? Now, it's a response planning will prepare the organization to respond quickly, identify uh, what tools and data sources we need as we are performing all of this planning exercises. We might see gaps that we need to fill. Now, having all this planning in place ensures everyone is on the same page. Response will be faster, and if an attacker sees some of the controls in place, sometimes uh, it can actually dissuade them because you per you represent a stronger target for them. One of the things that I constantly tell customers and I include in my presentations is that you control the battle space. So depending on the controls that you have in place, you control what tools do they use because they don't want to be detected or some of the tools may not function properly or some of the tools are going to be degraded in the way that they uh, can be used or not be used at all. In addition to that, you affect their operational tempo because now they need to take additional steps to not be detected. And let's be honest, some of these crews are actually going after targets of opportunity. So if you present a stronger target, it will limit their actions and they'll move maybe to other targets that are going to be easier depending on how of a big of a target are you to them. Now, the next step that we're going to be talking about is vulnerability and configuration management. We are seeing ransomware groups quickly leverage vulnerabilities, uh, especially in remote software, edge devices like we saw with Avanti and networking appliances. Uh, when proof of concept code is made available, we start seeing mass exploitation within hours. It used to be 24 hours. Now we're seeing around two, four sometimes, depending uh, for some low level actors, then we are seeing more advanced actors grab those proof of concept tools and they're going to uh, enhance them, they're going to work more on them, so they're more efficient, or the implants, they'll switch them up to not match write-ups and stuff like that, but it happens very quickly. So it's very important that we identify vulnerabilities and we patch those as quickly as possible. In addition to that, configuration management also help us push mitigations. 
while those patches are being tested or even if the patch is available or not, many times the vendors are going to include mitigations, registry key changes, modifications uh, to configuration files and stuff like that which will mitigate the exploitation of all of this. And also they may say, hey, here are some data sources that you should be monitoring. And by having a very well-tuned configuration management automation process out there, um, SCCM, uh, Ansible, or any of the other configuration management solutions, this will allow you to quickly respond and move that over there into your different hosts, modify them and mitigate those risks. And at the same time, enable new data sources that will allow you to know, hey, are we able to, have we been targeted before or are we being targeted right now? Uh, depending if your data source is new or not. If the data source is not new, you can actually check backward and see if you have been a target while the, uh, all of this became public. And if it is not, now you have a data source that you can put in place and check if you detect a pre-existing presence of an attacker in your environment or somebody attacking or leveraging that vulnerability. Uh, in addition to that, the next step that we recommend in the blog post is monitoring and detection. Monitor is not the difficult part, if I'm honest. Uh, in fact, the most difficult part is actually selecting what to monitor and how much to monitor because all of the solutions that we see out there for sims they're expensive so we have to be very targeted in addition to that if we look let's say for example at windows event logging uh the size is around 10 to 16 megs for some of the locks it's not that much attackers are going to override that uh instead of clearing the lock to not leverage an alert also day-to-day -day actions given uh how verbose are the events and windows for that specific event source they may be overridden. Uh, sometimes we go into an environment and we only have a couple of days of logs, sometimes a couple of hours, depending on the log source and, the, and source type. So going through this exercise for monitoring detection will allow us to actually identify where should we modify how much data we have there. Also, when it comes to monitoring detection, CTI, cyber threat intelligence, is a big source of real world data that we can use. In addition to that, we should augment that with our pen test and red team exercise results so we can get a better picture more tailored to us. Now, I have to be honest, CTI is not perfect. When it comes to CTI, what we're looking at and what we're seeing is what has been detected for the actor actually performing in the environment, not necessarily what uh, all of the actions that they're able to do or one of their associates are performing because it varies per engagement, it, they can bring other tooling, but it gives us patterns. And those patterns, we can use those as guides. Let's take, for example, when we look at most of the CTI reports when it comes to healthcare and we look at the top actors and the most capable ones, we saw Lockbit, we saw Black Hat, Ivanti, and I know that they have been brought down by the FBI, but we have to remember their associates use that platform. So we're looking at the behavior of the multiple associates using those platforms when we look at those reports. They'll go after LSAS for credentials in the machine. Um, so if we look at the pattern, they're going after credentials that are stored in the machine. That means that also if we have one password, uh, last pass, a uh, password, they're going to go after that. If we also have uh, password vaults, they're going to go after that. If we have browsers, user safe passwords, in browsers constantly, they're going to go after that. So it might not be in the CTI report, but we can look at the pattern and we can add those data sources. Now, one of the best ways to leverage this type of data is to build a list of attackers that have targeted your organization directly, your partners, your competitors, your sector. And once we have all of this information, we then filter for the most capable actors and we can leverage a tool, let's say like MITRE Attack Navigator, to look for overlaps. Where do they overlap by just providing scoring? And this will give us kind of like a rough list of techniques that we can focus. Now, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that we have this list of techniques and with the score, the highest one's always going to be encryption, defacement, because they're going to be encrypting all kinds of files. They're going to be putting a message like, hey, pay up. What we want to do is that we want to map all of that uh, into an attack path. Because what we want to do is that the most common ones we look for are going the ones that impact earlier in the attack chain for, for our environment. 
now that we have all of this information, uh, now we have a roadmap that we can follow on what we should be monitoring for, uh, what techniques specifically. And this leads us to defensive efficiency. Now for those techniques we identify, we need to see if we are collecting the correct information from our data sources. Um, this will let us know if we should bring in new tooling or if we to enhance the data that we have for processes. So for example, a tool like Sysmon includes a lot of metadata on the binaries themselves, which is awesome. Uh, this may also mean that we need to implement better controls or newer controls into the environment by just looking at how efficient is the data that we have there for us to respond. So that is something very important that we learn by performing threat hunting exercises or tabletop exercises that will provide us the data to validate how efficient all of that is. Now, once we have all of this stuff, we move forward to validating. And the best way of validating is performing red team and penetration testing. Uh, we need to validate that we have so far done uh, is the best way of us approaching the problems. And one of the best approaches here is to perform assumed breach type of exercises. This will give us more bang for our buck because we are not losing a lot of time trying to get that initial foothold. We're just there and we're able to look for specific actions, test how we respond to those. Do, have we missed anything? And specifically when we go, let's say for example, of our red teamer, a red teamer many times is a subject matter expert in some of those technologies and he can look for outliers or modification to known techniques to see if we are covering those to make sure that we amplify uh, our coverage and that we expand uh, the different scenarios that we're able to address when somebody's attacking our environment so that's very good later on if we want to do a full type of exercise when we don't include assume breach you can do it but my recommendation personally is to go with an assumed breach first. Um, so I hope that you guys liked the video. Go over to our web page and look at the blog post. I'm going to put a link of the blog post in the description of the video itself. And again, thank you for your time and I'll see you guys in the next video.